Uh, let me go ahead and welcome everybody for joining us. My name is Tom Giovanetti. I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation. We're delighted that you could all join us today for our Zoom with, with, our, with our friend and Wall Street Journal columnist, Kim Strassel. Uh, probably some of you at least remember that we originally had Kim book to join us here in Dallas this past spring for one of our Sumner's Distinguished Lecture Series luncheons. That was back before everything went haywire. Uh, we're still going to try to bring Kim to Dallas this fall if we possibly can make that happen. But in the meantime, Zoom will have to do. And uh, of course, the, the nice thing about Zoom is it opens up our audience to an audience outside of the Dallas area. And I know we have folks joining us today from all around the country. And we're delighted that you could be with us today. Let me do a little Zoom housekeeping for those of you who are not yet thoroughly Zoomed out. Um, you have the ability to turn your video on and off. Uh, we thoroughly enjoy seeing your smiling faces and your spare bedrooms and your dining room tables and your home offices. But if you don't want to share that with us, you have the ability to turn your video on and off as you see fit. You do not have the ability to turn your microphone on and off as you see fit. Uh, I've got everybody muted and uh, we'll keep everybody muted during Kim's talk. And then when we get to the Q&A section, we'll selectively unmute people's microphones uh, so that they can ask their questions. Uh, and the way we'll do that is down at the bottom of your little Zoom window, you have a participants menu. And if you click on the participants menu, you'll see that you have an option to raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, that'll mean you have a question and you'll show up in my queue. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can in the order that they come in. We'll still have people joining us probably for the next few minutes, but out of respect of Kim's time and everyone else's time, we'll go ahead and get rolling. Our guest today is Kim Strassel. She's a well-known member of the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, as well as its weekly Potomac Watch columnist. Kim was awarded the Bradley Prize in 2014 and is a frequent guest on uh, new shows and interview shows. Kim is the author of, author of three books and frankly is known for her penetrating insight and analysis of political and policy controversies in Washington, DC. And we're really delighted to have Kim with us today. Kim, I was thinking this morning that the history books will undoubtedly devote at least a paragraph to the year 2020. <laughs> There's an awful lot going on and we're only six months in. So much has happened in the first six months of the year that I think people have already forgotten that four months ago, Congress impeached the president. And yet, and yet we seem to have all forgotten about that. That seems like it never happened or like it's in the, in the distant past. Uh, just today, we've had a significant development in the Michael Flynn case, which you've been covering and which you've been writing about. Uh, and I'm sure our audience will want to hear your thoughts on that. But what's dominating the headlines these days, of course, is not only the impact of the COVID-19 virus on the economy and on the country and the reopening and all of that, but in particular, all of this social unrest that has exploded recently as a result of the George Floyd killing and uh, those, those issues. Um, here at IPI, we've done a lot of work on judicial reform and on justice reform. It seems obvious to us that there are some definite problems related to policing and police unions and qualified immunity and things like that. But it also seems that a lot of other people with a lot of other agendas are sort of hijacking the, the, George, the George Floyd incident to, to create chaos for their own purposes and for their own agendas. Uh, and you know, I found, my, I found myself the last few evenings wondering when are the authorities going to step up and simply prevent vandalism of public property and destruction of, of public treasures. You wrote an interesting column last week about the fact that Republicans have the elements of what you called an opportunity agenda that actually would address a lot of these concerns that we have right now, uh, if only Republicans are able to actually sort of communicate that agenda and to communicate those elements to, to, uh, to the country and to the voters as the election is coming up. So that's a lot of territory to cover, but I'm sure our audience would love to hear your thoughts on all of that. And then, as I mentioned, we'll do a moderated Q&A at the end so that they'll have an opportunity to ask their questions. But at this point, that's enough of me. So Kim, let me turn things over to you. And thanks again so much for joining us today. Well, First of all, Tom, thank you for that and that question for having me and thanks to everyone who has 
tuned in. Um, I'm looking forward to a really great discussion here today. Um, a couple of small housekeeping things on, on my side. Um, I am neither, they, you all asked me to give some, you know, opening remarks about a subject. And since I'm not clever enough to have memorized them all, and I am not technologically savvy enough yet to have figured out how to turn my computer into a teleprompter, if you see me glancing over, I'm just looking at my notes. I'm not trying to not look at all of you. And uh, when we get into the, the moderated discussion, you'll see enough of my full on ugly mug at that point. So just uh, bear with me as I look down. And as you said, there is so much to talk about. Um, we are living in some momentous times. Uh, the Michael Flynn decision today, uh, the virus and the new numbers that have been coming out, spending the economy. Um, but I appreciate that question you just asked, because obviously one of the, the biggest dominating headlines is all of this ongoing protests and violence um, over racial quality since the death of George Floyd on May 25th. So we've been doing this for nearly a month now, which is hard to believe. Um, it's been very difficult to watch, very difficult to endure for people who are living in some of these cities where it is worst hit. But I would make the argument that there is an opening here. There is a opportunity for those of us who have been longtime promoters of free markets and free people uh, to talk about the opportunities out there, um, especially because we've been making these arguments for years. So as I would suggest, this is just a, there is a, a glimmer of hope that we can turn something good out of this. I think what we see at the moment is a debate that is sadly shaping up along the kind of familiar and predictable partisan lines. And so let's talk a little bit about where that is going on the left. Uh, they, they have very much attempted to sort of devolve this entire debate down to the argument that somehow America is plagued with systemic racism and that our institutions are fatally flawed and that therefore the only answer is to tear everything down and begin again. And I think in that attitude comes all of the pandemonium and sort of crazy demands that we are seeing unfurling across the country. That's how you end up getting riots. It's how you end up getting looting. It's how you get people tearing down and defacing statues, how you get calls to defund the police it's how you get autonomous zones in places like Seattle and in other cities where they're trying to set them up now. And it's how you get just today, Senate Democrats filibustering and killing a, a good faith effort by Senator Tim Scott to come up with a modest federal policing reform bill. I think we're also, however, though, and that really came to the fore this week, seeing the failure of that approach and that argument. You know, when you license mobs to rule, you get mob rule. And I think one of the greatest failings we have seen over the last month has been the silence of a lot of Democratic politicians and liberal leaders who have just sat by as these riots have raged or even worse, expressed solidarity with that approach. That is how you get this past week of people tearing down statues. Uh, for, in my mind, what are some increasingly absurd reasons. You know, when you go after Stevie Ray Vaughan, something is just wrong out there. <laughs> um, but I, by all means, let's have a discussion and debate in this country about the role of statues. But that needs to be done within the democratic arena with votes, with the actions of duly elected representatives, not self-appointed vigilantes. You know, for the last month as well in Seattle, we have seen Mayor Jenny Durkin, who got behind the people who took over part of that city and talked about how great it was and promised that we were going to have a summer of love. But let's be really clear what she was supporting in that action. The individuals and the businesses that own buildings in that area who live in that zone did not vote for any of these protesters and occupiers to be their new leaders. They did not vote for any of the rules or to the extent that there even are any in that area to be put in place. We have a system in this country, it is the bedrock of this country where we elect representatives who then pass laws on our behalf. None of that happened in CHOP or whatever they are calling themselves these days in Seattle. The businesses and homeowners in that area were simply handed over to mob rule. 
And it's an utter dereliction of duty of the elected officials in Seattle who are charged with protecting their citizens and upholding liberty. And as a result, we're seeing the very predictable consequences of that. A 17-year-old kid was shot to death in the zone over the weekend. Two others were also seriously injured. And so now, belatedly, we have Mrs. Durkin admitting that this was a mistake, that this approach was wrong. She says she's going to clear out the zone. We still don't know exactly how she's going to do it, but at least it seems to be a recognition, although after and only after a lot of prodding by her police uh, and superintendent and other people to finally be taking some action and restoring the rule of law there. The Seattle situation, in my mind, also shows the lack of, of thought and rationale behind the calls that we've seen over the last month to defund the police. The CHOP zone is a living example of what happens, what you get when there are no police. It's clearly a failure. And while it took a month, we are at least now seeing some Democratic politicians admitting the problems and stepping back from the defund the police mo movement. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but Mayor Lori Lightfoot of Chicago made some extraordinary statements over the past couple of days. She said that while defund the police makes a nice hashtag, uh, the practical realities of doing so are much harder. She noted, and I found this really interesting that she went here, 90% of policing costs are in personnel. So if you decide that you're going to cut costs, what you're really saying is that you're going to cut officers. But firings and cutting officers are all dictated by collective bargaining agreements. And those agreements demand that junior officers get cut first. And so as Ms. Lightfoot noted, when because most of the policing department in Chicago, the diversity rests within their junior officers, when you are calling for defunding police, you are calling, and by the way, these are her words, to fire black and brown people. Uh, this is obviously not a step forward if you're trying to uh, correct your diversity in your policing ranks. And as the mayor also noted, it's not really great if you're trying to create jobs that lead to middle class incomes for minorities in cities. So when you begin from the premise that this country is systemically racist, you can't really have any debates about the real problems. We aren't having a serious debate right now about policing reform about the real problems and what honestly might be done to fix them. We aren't having a broader discussion about the riots and what's that doing to business owners that are attempting to come back after our virus lockdowns, and particularly what it's doing to minority employees and minority business owners of, of places that have not been able to open again. Uh, but that is the approach right now that you are getting from many in the left. And I think the true pity is that a lot of it's coming from politics and a desire to encourage anger and encourage bitterness and to hope that some of this ends up having an effect that they like in the November elections. Meanwhile, on the right, on the other side of the fault lines, and I'm gonna to try to be a little equal opportunity here, I think the, the only response we've been getting too often, or at least the one that too many in the public hear is just the blunt response of law and order. And believe me, I believe in law and order. And believe me, I think the sooner we get back to it, the better. Uh, but I think the problem in that messaging and the problem for Republicans is that this misses th that for many, many Americans, yes, they want law and order, but they also understand something's not right. There are issues out there that we absolutely need to confront. And we want an end to the violence, but they're also, we want some solutions to some of the bigger problems. And this is where I think we really do end up having that opening because, you know, when we step back, we see that obviously this country is not systemically racist by any means. But we also do see some inequalities, and I like to categorize them as inequalities of opportunity. And that is the case, by the way, that is something that many of us have talked about for years. It's been the foundation of a lot of the policies and agenda that we have pushed for. You know, we have inner city schools that are absolutely failing our children, and particularly minority children. Schools where the vast majority of the kids, even by fourth grade in standardized tests, fail the most basic standards for reading and math and writing. You know, we have an education system that right now too often prioritizes only four years of college and white collar jobs and leaves behind millions of Americans 
that might otherwise be forging successful careers and skilled trades if only we had and people were helping to, them to get good quality vocational training. We have laws and regulations on the federal level and at the state level that lock people out of jobs, whether they're minimum wage requirements or occupational licensing restrictions. We have laws that make starting a business and complying with 25 separate regulatory agencies just too hard for too many budding entrepreneurs. And we have entire sections of cities that businesses don't invest in, don't even go into because they are worried about high crime or excessive taxation. We have environmental regulations and calls for yet more that put at risk millions of jobs in the fossil fuel sector and supporting sectors. So both the virus and the kind of recent racial unrest have shined a new light again on these inequalities of opportunity. And at this very moment, you know, think about it. There are any number of white collar elites all holed up in their apartments, all safe in their jobs, calling for continued lockdowns of the country. And it's blue collar workers and service workers who are the ones that have lost their jobs, uh, small business owners who've been forced to close their doors. There's, there's disparities there. The racial debate is one again, once again shown that there are just too many minorities who are missing their chance at the American dream. And so in all this, I see a real opening for free market people uh, to change the debate. You know, if you think about it, Donald Trump four years ago, he ran on the theme, make America great again. And I, I would argue that if conservatives were smart, they'd have a modification of a theme like that for this year's election, because it's a very compelling agenda. Make America great again for all. And the good news, uh, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but when the president had a round table in Texas just a couple of weeks ago, those were in fact some of the main themes. The attorney general talked about how school choice was a civil rights issue of our time, and I totally agree with it. The housing and urban development secretary, Ben Carson, talked about disparities in health outcomes and how the administration is continuing to work to provide more affordable insurance, which is one way in which we deal with those disparities of outcome. Providing more jobs that get people off of welfare, off of Medicaid and into better healthcare and better insurance. Uh, work that the administration was doing to provide more telemedicine, getting care into areas that is lacking now. Secretary Carson also, as an aside, talked about opportunities that exist from remote learning. He had a great example saying, what if you could take one of the, the, the nation's best high school science teachers and just beam him into the living room of kids that otherwise aren't getting a quality education? We listened to Scott Turner, who was the executive, who is the executive director of the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council, talk about the enormous success we're already having with Opportunity Zones. And I'm sure many of you know about these. These were created as part of the 2017 tax cut. And for the lack of a better description, they offer tax benefits to corporations that choose to invest in distressed communities. They've already been a big success, funneling tens of billions of dollars into areas and creating thousands of jobs. And if you want to know the real measure of how great they've been, Democrats are now on a campaign to kill them because they know just how important this is and because it, it works in opposition to their argument of more government spending. One of the benefits of an agenda like this is that it's already there. As I mentioned, a lot of us have been talking about these kind of things for years and years. It's a question really of how you use this moment to further spread that message and get through to more numbers of voters. And another benefit that is at this extraordinary time that we've just had in our economy and after Washington has blown the bank on this virus, this is an agenda that doesn't rest necessarily on promising trillions of dollars more in spending or uh, an infrastructure bill or other electoral year goodies. And I think a further benefit is that the infrastructure for this agenda already exists within the administration. For all the nonsense attacks we get all the time claiming this administration as racist, it's already done some extraordinary work on school choice, on vocational training, on opportunity zones. That White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council I mentioned only last month put out a really interesting report where they talked about best practices around the country for expanding, expanding opportunity. Um, and these are all ideas that can be built upon. If you haven't looked at that report, I, I certainly suggest you take a moment. 
And we also know, now I'm getting close to being done here and we'll <laughs> then move on. But one of the things that I love about this is that we know that these ideas, these opportunity ideas are a real opportunity to grow believers, converts and followers and free market ideas, they work. I have just a, one great story to give an example of it. Uh, I was down earlier this year before the lockdowns uh, in January at an event in Florida, and I had the opportunity to hear Governor Ron DeSantis speak. And he provided a really fascinating statistic, one that proved something that I've always believed, which is that good policy does equal good politics. Now, if you remember in 2018, uh, Mr. DeSantis was running for that office against Andrew Gillum, a progressive black Democrat. In the end, <clears throat> about 650,000 black women in Florida went to the polls in 2018. And an extraordinary 100,000 of them voted not for Mr. Gillum, but for Mr. DeSantis, 18% of them, which is, you guys know, follow politics, that is a big number, a big percentage. Now, given that Mr. DeSantis won by a margin of about 40,000 votes, those black females that voted for him were absolutely decisive in his victory. They gave him his victory. And why did they vote for him? Two words, school choice. Florida has its Step Up Students program, which provides some $100,000, 100,000 low-income students with tax uh, credit funded scholarships to attend private schools. Most of those students are minorities whose mothers are registered Democrats. Mr. DeSantis was strongly in favor of expanding this program. Mr. Gillum was strongly opposed to any school choice. <coughs> Voters understood that issue and they went and they made their voices heard. And, and in this is what I'm saying is the opportunity to get everybody uh, the message out there. So everybody in this country wants opportunity. And, and that gives us an extraordinarily powerful moment, I think, uh, to promote opportunity and to make some headway in these things that we've long believed in. And so consider that my attempt in what has been a very trying year to try to create uh, or suggest that there is a, an opportunity to make something lasting and important out of all of the upheaval we otherwise see. So with that, uh, that's just my sort of opening thoughts. I'm happy to talk more about that and anything else anyone would like to, to chat about. Thanks, Kim, that's really terrific. I had not seen or heard uh, that Florida anecdote that you mentioned, that's really stunning. It is stunning, again, because you know, there's a lot of people who suggest that uh, conservative ideas or free market ideas are simply no, non-starters among vast sections of the voting electorate. And that's just not true. Uh, sometimes it takes a lot of sustained effort um, and a lot of courage, uh, but you get out there and you go to those communities and, and you, they see them work and then there's an opportunity to build. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then I'm going to throw it open to questions from others. But for those of you in the audience, if you already have a question, please go down and go down to the participants menu and click on the raise your hand option so that you get in the queue uh, so that we can get to your question before we have to wrap things up. So Kim, you mentioned um, earlier this idea of structural racism. And I'm always struck in, in these policy debates about the fact that no one ever defines their terms. And if you, if you think about structural racism, when I think about structural, I'm thinking about law and policy. And it seems to me that we have pretty much excised racism from our law and policy, not just from the Civil Rights Act, but all of the things that have happened since then. So I don't really understand what people are talking about when they talk about structural racism. Now, there's always going to be racism at the personal level because we can't brainwash people. We can't control what people think or, or how they feel. So it's not that. It's not law and policy. I just wonder, I just wonder if, how do, you, how do we even have this discussion or debate with people if we sort of can't agree on the terms? It strikes me we've done about everything we can do in the law and policy area. It also strikes me that you, you can't have a free society if you're going to determine outcomes. So there's likely to always be some disparity in outcomes. So just what are your thoughts on how we can even have this discussion if, if, if people won't define their terms or if we don't agree on the definitions? 
Well, you make an excellent point and, and you should be happy to know that you are joined in that point by none other than one of my favorite people uh, to watch these days who brings me great comfort in watching him on TV and appearances, Shelby Steele, who ha has made this point over and over in recent interviews that I've seen him give saying, look, I lived through structural racism. You know, uh, when I was growing up, there was enforced segregation, okay, and Jim Crow laws that definitely uh, made the system unequal, made the system unjust. Uh, and then he talks about how America, and one of the great things about this country is it embraced that unfortunate past and took efforts to correct it and change it. And that we have a result uh, ended up in the place where you describe, which is that there isn't anything in law anymore uh, that uh, anything comes close to institutional or systemic racism. It simply isn't the case. Now, I would argue folks on the other side refuse to define that because they know that they then lose the argument. And if you can keep it vague, then you can you wander into these other kind of terrifying aspects of what we've seen in the last month, this cancel culture. You can, you can argue that any act or anything that anyone says uh, doesn't fall under the definition of free speech. Uh, it somehow uh, accounts for micro-targeting or racism or sort of latent, uh, deep down um, racist position. Um, and, and this to me has been just as concerning. We're seeing people wiped out of academia. Uh, we are seeing journalists uh, being canceled and uh, complete purges of, you know, when, when the New York Times says that there is something incorrect or, or institutionally wrong with running an op-ed from a United States senator and that people actually are asked to leave or get fired over that, the fourth estate is in a big problem. But this is how many want that debate to be fine because then they can make accusations, then they can make change through that way, right? Uh, and they can scare and cow people into not expressing their views and not even having the debate. I always argue, you know, if you, you believe you can't win a debate, the next best thing is to make sure that you shut down those who would debate with you. And that is what we are seeing going on at the moment. And the only way that gets corrected is more people are going to have to stand up. And unfortunately, you know, I, I think that has to be done among Democratic politicians as well. And, you know, so far I have counted about two that have actually made some comment about how it's inappropriate to tear down statues. But so far we are having a, a total lack of leadership on that side. You know, just as an aside, you mentioned the New York Times and the Tom Cotton op-ed. And, you know, this may just be a function of, of my age, but, you know, th this, this, this phenomenon that the inmates are running the asylums now is so strange and jarring to me. I mean, it used to be that, you know, management ran the company, <laughs> not, not, the most junior, not the most junior employees. And it seems like what, a lot of what we see going on right now and I'm thinking about, you know, the Atlantic firing Kevin Williamson in the same way. It seems like it's the most junior employees at these media organizations who are able to control what the organization does. I don't, I just don't understand how the management of these companies are so cowed by the, sometimes the most junior members of their organizations. Well, it's fuzzy thinking, right? I mean, look, we all want corporations and institutions where people feel inclusive, uh, and feel people feel as though there is opportunity, people feel as though they're in a, a good, positive working environment. And, you know, absolutely, every newspaper should strive to create that sort of working environment. But that's a completely separate question from the mission of journalism. Um, and one of the things that I have found so discouraging and disappointing about these, these recent newspaper purges is, you know, we've also been having a debate about social media and censorship. Um, I would argue that at least in that case, it's a private company. I don't agree with it, but it's a private company and they can make their rules. Journalism it, it was born of the First Amendment. Our founders, uh, you know, there's a reason the First Amendment is first. It understood that the Fourth Estate was not just a, a sideline, but an absolutely integral part of, of a representative republic. Um, and that you could not make this work 
uh, unless you had a functioning and free press. And when the press is self-censoring itself, when it's forgotten that mission, not just in terms of being cowed uh, about what they run, but also in terms of, of covering one-sided issues, having double standards, which we've seen, unfortunately, the last four years, ever since Donald Trump was elected, look at the Russia collusion uh, story and how badly they have handled that. Then you don't have a free and functioning press, and we have lost something incredibly important in society. Okay. I... Uh... Uh, our first question is going to come from Bob Hyde, but Bob, we were getting a ton of extra noise from you, so I had to go back and mute you again. Kim, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to open things up uh, to the floor, and we'll go to Bob first. Um, I just want to get your thoughts. Your, your presentation is very much a sort of a policy presentation, talking about the opportunity agenda and all of that. And of course, you know, we at IPI, we're a policy shop too. You know, our answer to everything is always a change in policy. But it seems like a lot of times we on the right are talking policy and folks on the left are talking something entirely differently. So someone, I heard someone illustrate it this way and I thought it was interesting. You know, when the Black Lives Matter folks, you know, want everyone to say Black Lives Matter, some of us on the right are, are inclined to say, well, all lives matter. And it was someone explained to me, look, if your wife asked you, do you love me? And you said, well, I love everyone. She would not see that as a satisfactory response. <laughs> and, and that kind of, that makes a little bit of sense to me that it seems to me that, that, you know, on the BLM side, they're looking for more than just all lives matter. They're looking for some sign, I guess, that, 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 that we care and that we acknowledge what's going on. Now the organization Black Lives Matter itself is another matter. That's a pretty, that's a pretty Marxist revolutionary organization. But it does seem to me that one of, the, one of the gaps we have yet to cross is this idea that we on the right always wanna pose policy solutions and somehow that's a different vocabulary than the left wants to speak. Well, look, politics uh, and policy go together. The politics side of it is sometimes emotion, right? Um, and people do want to hear that from their politicians. It's why we always say, we do these polls and say, are, are politicians liked? Are they believed? Um, you know, that has nothing to do with their policy agenda. It has to do with our personal connection to them and our emotional attachment. Do we believe that they are there to actually help us? And so I agree. I think people on the right, uh, often default almost entirely to policy, whereas those on the left often are appealing to that emotion. And, and that kind of gets to my point about the opportunity here in that, unfortunately, I believe too many on the left are appealing to the anger, to the bitterness, trying to sort of sow discord, to agitate people. It's certainly an emotion that resonates with folks. But I think the, the, the way that you approach it on the right, the way that you approach it for free market conservatives uh, is to appeal to hope. Um, and you know that is what exists that people want right now. Look, we have just lived through an extraordinary moment. This shutdown is something no one could ever have thought and has been so disorienting in terms of the lockdowns and the economic you know, devastation that has come with it. Um, and then right on from that, and probably connected and related into these riots and all of this uh, racial unrest across the country, people right now want some leadership and they want someone to say, and I, and I don't care if it, what your color is or everyone right now wants to hear uh, elected leaders who say, I understand your particular problems and I want to give you hope that we're going to fix it. And here, by the way, also are the policies we intend to do so. But we have to, we have to do a better job of reaching out to communities and letting everyone know that these are not just, you know, ideas scribbled on a piece of paper, that they are designed to actually truly help and to fix problems that we all recognize exist. Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to our questions from our audience. Our first question is from Bob Hyde. Bob, you are, your mic is <coughs> muted, so go ahead, please. Thank you, Kim, for joining our group. It's been a delight listening to you. Um, one you. of the things I'm concerned about is the uh, vote by mail. Uh, having grown up from a, I live in Dallas now, but I grew up in a small town north of here called Chicago. 
and uh, <laughs> I'm used to knowing people who had uh, um, who voted and they show up at the polls and they've been told they've already voted and I know about these things is this something we should be concerned about and if we if it is as as um, as bad as I fear it will be when will conservatives find their voice and explain that this uh, stealing an election, we're in a society where the end seems to justify the means, how can we reverse this trend? And I'll remute and listen to you avidly. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. We should be deeply, deeply concerned, but I think for two reasons. You mentioned the potential fraud aspect of this. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, uh, for better or worse, I grew up in Oregon, which is, as many of you may know, is a, a totally mail-in ballot system. There was enormous pushback when that system was first instituted, because when you think about it, 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 it makes you realize just how fragile and easy the system is open to corruption. You know, you have a ballot that shows up, <coughs> excuse me, at somebody's house, somebody signs it and sends it back. Was it, was it really that person who did it? Uh, did their kid fill it out on their behalf? Uh, if you have an, uh, an older American and then, you know, tell them, hey, sign this, and they don't know what they're signing. There's a lot of opportunities there for fraud. Um, I think the fraud question grows even larger, uh, and the Attorney General was pointing to this recently, when you are talking about doing it on a vast scale. And that's a really important point to remember here as well, too which is that Democrats say, oh, we've done vote by mail for years. We can do this. We're never at this scale, not at all. And you're already seeing the significant problems of it. And that gets to the second point, which is that quite aside, and I think this is an argument that those of us who care about electoral integrity should be making, quite aside from issues of fraud, there is the simple question of practicality and, uh, and, and the, the complete upheaval we have seen so far, ballots coming in, you know, weeks after the election was closed, taking a long time to sort of go through them and figure out, uh, you know, are they legitimate or not, elections that aren't getting called for days and days and days. I mean, I am old enough to have lived through, uh, more pity me, you know, the, the Bush v. Gore recount, okay? and. Uh, remember the stories of people standing there, you know, you have three vote, uh, three lawyers, okay, and they pick up a ballot, one says, oh, that's definitely for Bush, one says that's definitely for Gore, and one says, oh, I don't know, I don't even think this vote should count. Um, can you imagine doing that on a national scale in a presidential election? You know, within a day of the polls closing, the lawyers would rush in, there would be a fight over every single absentee ballot. Was it legitimately signed? Was it not? Especially in swing states and areas where things are close. And that, that brings up another potential for fraud, which is that the votes aren't really being counted fairly, but rather they're being argued over. And it's a question of who has the better or more savvy lawyers, uh, what administration is in charge of that particular precinct and voting and, and the procedures for recounts we could have a real mess in November. And uh, so I think it's incumbent upon Republicans not just to blow the whistle on this, not to just to start talking about the practicalities and fraud questions, but for local leaders and state leaders to begin implementing uh, systems in which they can guarantee some form of in-person ballot, uh, in-person voting in November and, and, and lay the, the groundwork for that so that other states can be pressured to follow. Thanks for your question, Bob. Our next question is from Michelle Corson. Michelle, go ahead, please. Michelle, you are unmuted. Go ahead with your question, please. And we cannot hear Michelle, so we're going to go on to our next question. Uh, Joe Barnett will be our next question. Joe, if you can unmute your microphone, and you can go ahead, please. Okay. Technology is so hard. Well, you know, we've had good luck so far with these events, but let me, um, looks like I have lost Joe. 
Well, I'm here, but you okay. can't. Okay. Oh, well, that's great. Oh, great. Well, well, go ahead then, Joe, please. Hi. Uh, see, I have one of these microphones and it also Ooh. has a mute button on it. So I could okay. be muted three or four ways here. That could be it. Um, hi. That's fancy, by the way. Oh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, hi. I uh, was, uh, I read your uh, uh, column the other day about Trump versus Trump. I guess that was about a week ago. And uh, so I've, uh, over the weekend, uh, I watched a couple of interviews with John Bolton. Okay. And I, uh, you may not want to talk about all of that, but I was impressed <laughs> if you've seen it, the, his interview on Fox was, uh, he said, um, there was Hillary and he knew what her program was. Oh, uh, and there was uh, Trump and he decided to take, you know, what, what did he have to lose? You know, maybe Trump would be okay. So he voted for Trump. And now after four years, he decided uh, he didn't like Trump. So he's not gonna vote for him, but he's not gonna vote for Biden. Mm. So it seems to me, uh, you say, you know, Trump, uh, <clears throat> needs to uh, not run against Trump, which is what he's doing right now. Uh, is there for a sliver of voters like me, I guess we're sort of reluctant Trump voters, uh, Republican Trump voters, reluctantly. But uh, <laughs> now we've seen some good things. On the other hand, we've seen four years and we know it'll be four more years of chaos. And also four more years where we're just going to hold our breath that he just, you know, doesn't go off the reservation into some <laughs> wacky thing. Okay. Uh, actually, I thought the interview was pretty good from that sense point of view. It's like, well, uh, so here four years later and after all that, I'm not going to vote for Biden either, you know. So uh, is there an opportunity between now and the election? to define Biden or for Biden, do we expect Biden to come out and tell us, hey, I'm the new Hillary, you know, I am the green, uh, gonna tax you to death, gonna regulate you to death. We're gonna get back to the normal. We're gonna get back to solar panel jobs for everybody, you know, and one, one half percent growth per year. Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen between now? Thank yeah, I, it's an excellent point. I mean, I'm, I'm of the uh, belief that we haven't really seen a real campaign yet. And so folks that are already looking at polls and saying, uh, you know, this race is won or lost one direction or another are fooling themselves. Uh, because what we've essentially had the last four months is, you know, the Donald Trump show uh, <laughs> between all the coronavirus briefings and, and, you know, he's been in the news a lot, obviously, lately because of the unrest out there, usually to be found tweeting law and order, law and order. Um, you know, so you haven't really, and Joe Biden's been hiding in his basement. And by the way, I think that that is a very calculated decision on his part. I mean, it allows him to suggest that he's following all of the, you know, medical guidance about, you know, social distancing and everything, but it also has allowed him to duck almost any question and to, I think, at least adequately so far, define this race as a referendum on Donald Trump and his leadership. Uh, Trump, I don't know if he can win if that is the race uh, that is run. Uh, not that his base isn't really excited for him, they are but you need some more of those voters. You need some people in the middle. You need some independence. You know, I, I worry sometimes, I think the Trump administration's strategy is to try to grow the base and turn it out. You know, huge levels of enthusiasm and get everyone to the polls. That's obviously an important part of this, but they are gonna need some independence. They are gonna need some of those suburban housewives. Uh, you know, are they, they're gonna need some disaffected Democrats. Um, and if he's out there constantly sort of making it all about him and allowing the press to turn his every word into a, you know, a, another unfair story, uh, it's gonna be really hard to bring those people back. So uh, 
I have given up. I gave up a long time ago suggesting that Donald Trump needs to exercise some discipline <laughs> because it's not really his forte, right? And by the way, I'd like to point out, I, I know there's a lot of people who admire him for that. I still though am of the belief that if you can get this race back to a kind of normal uh, for political races in which there are debates in which there are, you know, dueling ads online, in which people are making uh, this about the contrast. Then it becomes uh, a much closer race, and he has a much greater opportunity to to win. Especially because one thing that also keeps getting lost in the political calculation, everyone is looking at these national polls, which, by the way, as most of you probably know, are a completely dumb way to look at where the race stands because who cares what nationally the view is of Trump? You know, a lot of those voters are from New York and California. They have nothing to do with swing states and the electoral college. You need to look at the state polls. And most of them show a much, much tighter race. But if you dig into these polls, one thing that ought to be hugely concerning if you are Joe Biden is that, you know, Donald Trump has more than 90% of his base enthusiastically supporting him for reelection. Um, Biden's number seems to be more like 36 to 40 percent of his people enthusiastically support him for election. There's a big division that remains in the Democratic Party. And a lot of people who are very unsatisfied that Biden became the nominee rather than Bernie Sanders, whether or not those people come out to vote is could be absolutely crucial in this question in this uh, coming election. Thanks, Kim. Um, Michelle Corson has asked her question in the group chat which we discourage, but she was having microphone issues. Uh, her question is related to the, to the Mueller investigation, the Russia issue, the evidence of, of real political activity at the upper echelons of the FBI. Kim, you did a ton of work on this, and uh, you covered it probably to a greater extent than anybody in journalism. Uh, and Michelle's question is, will the truth ever come out, and will those who did wrong, will they ever have to answer for it? I think the opportunity for the truth to come out exists, but uh, time is running very, very short. And this is, I'll be honest, this is my biggest concern right now as we look forward to the upcoming election, which is that if Democrats take the White House, uh, or in, indeed if Democrats take the Senate, we will lose any opportunity to learn anything more about what happens. So, you know, uh, send a tweet out to Lindsey Graham uh, uh, get them on the horn and tell them to get on with these hearings. Uh, you know, we've now, look, we've learned a lot, which is really important. Uh, having that inspector general report that came out in December uh, and the ones prior to it in which we talked about Comey and he's leaking, um, Andrew McCabe's behavior, uh, that set a lot of things in the record, okay? Uh, it confirmed a lot of what many of us have been reporting, but up until then, uh, we've not had a kind of neutral source come out and, and validate it. And we have that now. And we have an enormous amount of information about the FBI's activity and behavior, uh, basically, at least from the date at which they started this counterintelligence investigation in July of 2016. The real question for Durham, uh, the, the U.S. attorney who is getting into this, is what happened prior to that? What led up to this? Were there political shenanigans? What were our foreign intelligence allies doing? What role did they play? What role did our intelligence agencies play? Uh, and especially given prohibitions we have uh, against them interfering in US domestic politics. Uh, this is what he's looking into. Um, and I have, I have two fears. One, that Lindsey Graham does not get these hearings done. Um, we need to, uh, now that we've got all the facts in place, call people back in and compare those facts against things that they had told us in the past and draw out yet some more information. Uh, so that needs to happen. There's a long list of witnesses and time is growing short. My other fear is that John Durham, I mean, he's uh, by all accounts, just a straight arrow and a tough prosecutor. I have no fear that he will do what is right here. Um, but there are also a lot of indications that the way John Durham acts is that he, he shows his work through his prosecutions. Okay, so maybe we get some prosecutions, but that to me is not enough 
Uh, we need a report. We need something that gets put out publicly that sets into the record the behavior of different uh, actors in this, not just what comes out through a discrete, uh, a discrete court case here or there. Um, in terms of will people be held accountable? No one likes it when I say this, but I say it anyway because I truly believe it. Uh, my biggest, one of my biggest complaints in recent years prior to all of this has been prosecutorial abuse, okay? And the last thing I want to do is see conservatives setting a standard which we are trying to prosecute people uh, for very weak basis. Um, I know it's disturbing for people to hear, but, you know, Jim Comey knew exactly what he was doing. He's a very seasoned and talented lawyer. Uh, he worked very hard to make sure that the actions he took, while absolutely unprofessional, absolutely outrageous, didn't necessarily walk on the wrong side of the law, okay? I mean, it, it's a pity to know that, but uh, sometimes the consequences and accountability for people are being called out and humiliated or losing their jobs, which is what happened to him. I know it isn't very satisfying because the media uh, has actually continued to treat him as a hero, which is not the fate he deserves. Um, uh, and then we, we, we prosecute people who truly have violated the statute. So I'm, I'm pretty confident Durham will stick to that line. Um, but a lot of the accountability is going to have to come with getting the truth out and then uh, attempting to sort of blackball the bad actors from future government service. Okay, our next question is from Skip. But, but Skip, before you ask your question, um, we will probably have time for one or two more questions. So if you have a question, go down to the participants menu at the bottom of your Zoom window, click on raise your hand, and that way your question will show up in the queue. Skip, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Tom, for setting this up. This is Skip Kalb, and Kim, I've been a follower of yours for years. It's thank great you. to have an opportunity to have this. So my question and is obviously no right or wrong answer, but I would appreciate your thoughts on where do you see this social unrest movement going? You know, we're 130 plus days out from the election, uh, less than that for the political conventions. And it seems that if you're an advisor to the president, it's a bit of a Sophie's choice. On the one hand, you can say, well, you, you know, the local governments let these situations fester. They'll flame out and they'll deal with it. On the other hand, will they get so bad that the president has to intervene federally? And if that happens close to the convention, what does that mean? So, you know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I've been a, a big believer of, uh, I think the president needs to, my own advice, if I were advising the president, would um, be to come out and, and sort of set, set the red line for in what circumstances the federal government would intervene, okay? I don't think it's been necessarily politically helpful to him to be threatening right and left to send in the federal troops <laughs> because, you know, under what circumstances and why, I appreciate he wants to present the law and order theme and I totally get that. But I think what he does is he says, here's the red line. Um, you know, and I don't know what that is exactly, but, uh, you know, I am leaving it to you to maintain order in your city. It's what you were elected to do. And if you fail to do that uh, at, to a certain point, we will step in. Um, but in the meantime, I would be using this as an opportunity to ask the residents of those cities and those states if that is the kind of elected leadership they want. Um, and to, to, again, make that contrast. And, you know, I, I suppose it's sort of coming through in the things he says, that contrast, but not nearly as pointed as it could or resonating as much as it could or should. Because the, the way in which he does it, which is so often the way with Donald Trump, is it makes him sound as though he's, you know, threatening or a bully or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. uh, instead, he needs to be talking about um, law and order in the context of, of policies and and uh, the election and asking people, do they want to continue seeing this kind of environment day in and day out where businesses are looted and shut down or or not? And if not, they, they need to register their discontent at the ballot box. Which, uh, which is how Richard Nixon ended up getting elected, right? On right. a promise to restore law and order. Uh, our next question is from Paul Osborne. Paul, go ahead, please. Hey, yeah, hi, Kim. I appreciate the uh, 
the presentation and your writing at the journal, what is uh, what would you say to you know everyday average somewhat politically active citizens? We've got a you know Texas uh, Republican convention. I mean, what would your advice be for us uh, to do to take action on? Um, you know, we don't we don't have the uh, obviously the platform of a writer like yourself to take action uh, on on what on political on, on trying to talk about uh, how, how do we take the things that you said we, we I think most of us probably agree with but how do we help people get elected what what uh, steps should we be taking just as the average everyday sort of grassroots uh, person living in a neighborhood well the first thing I, I congratulate you for asking that question <laughs> because uh, this is one of my hobby horses out there I, I go out and, and you know people ask questions they go what can we do the federal government's such a mess like how do, how do we fix it and I always say if you want to fix things at the federal government focus on your local and state policies um, and and focus on your local and state elections you know we are uh, uh, a, a union of states and our uh, framers saw our first and immediate forms of government being our local and state representatives and I think it's so easy these days you know people turn on the TV and the cable news and everything's focused on on the federal government and the actions it is taking but it, it, and it's so much so that it astounds me I ask people sometimes when I go out in the audience I was like do you know who your elected state senator is do you know who your your local you know your your mayor is? Uh, do you know who's on your city council? Do you know when they're having their next meeting? Um, because I think there's two aspects of that. One, we have more of an ability to control the uh, environment that does most immediately affect us from a political perspective in terms of the schools that our kids are attending and uh, you know our uh, police enforcement and everything else that actually has to do with our day to day. But also, when you pay attention to those local uh, and state uh, conventions and, and meetings and elections, uh, you are demanding and creating a, a farm team of capable legislators who you then hope will go to Washington with some of the principles that we all care about. And we have the ability to, to influence that at a far more dramatic level uh, when we are engaged locally than we do federally. Um, it seems like an obvious point, but uh, it, it's always sort of remarkable to me how people, even people who are seriously engaged and knowledgeable about politics, um, kind of blank out the, the local side. So the first thing is just go and do what you're doing and, and attend with an agenda and let your lawmakers know what it is that, you know, you guys are demanding that they address um, that provides a certain level of accountability, which, you know, hopefully trickles up over time. Thanks for your question, Paul. The next question is from Elizabeth Whitaker. Elizabeth, go ahead, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, so the question I have is, how do we as individuals find our voice? I've talked to so many individuals who say, I feel so weak. I feel like I have nothing that I can really do. Our voice, you know, we do tweets, uh, we, we fundraise, but in the end, if our voices get raised, they get drowned out, it seems, by the roar of the crowd. Tucker Carlson the other day talked about when the mob took over, the, our leadership didn't respond. And it, it seems like for every 10, you know, for every thousand people on their side, there's maybe one person on our side who's effectively talking over the crowd. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, part of what I just, thank you for that question. Part of what I just said, uh, you gotta be engaged. Um, and, and so we should be calling our lawmakers right now and demanding that they respond, okay? We should be, uh, and, and, and by the way, I love, I mean, I have to use social media. It's part of what I do, but I also have a recognition that, you know, when my tweet goes out there, it, it lands in the ether and then it's kind of gone. Have I really affected anything or done anything? Um, so, but I think the other thing we need to do, uh, look, by the way, a little shout out to I, IPI, we need to remain engaged with organizations like this that are, uh, forming policy ideas and, uh, pushing them and have access to, or, or influence with some of our decision makers out there. And, um, and that's another way of saying that we need to be organized ourselves, right? what you just said was very important. One person on their own, uh, it's hard to be heard. 
but there are many, many people. You are not one in a thousand. Uh, I would actually argue that the silent majority in the country probably has, um, you know, views closer to some of the things we're talking about today than anything else. Um, you know, they kind of got a bad reputation uh, by the mainstream media who did everything they could to to undermine them. But, you know, when we had that Tea Party movement in 2009, it, it was very effective because there were groups around the country of like-minded people talking and demanding, in particular, that the conservative lawmakers that they elected um, change. Remember how we got there? I mean, that, that we'd had a Republican Party that had let a lot of people down on a lot of promises and kind of gotten lazy and just used to power. They got thrown out. And, and after Barack Obama was elected, people said, look, we want a new, we knew a new generation of leaders, and, but you need to pay attention to these things. That's where the kind of real power comes is, is being organized and, and working with other folks. Well, Kim, you just made the day of everybody here at IPI with that shout out. So thanks so much. Uh, our next question is from Carl. Carl, go ahead, please. Uh, um, Kim, I'm a longtime reader and admirer of yours. I'm worried about a, a fundamental political issue. And that is that Trump is such a dominating and hostile figure that I see the, I mean, I have lots of friends who are simply hysterical about Trump. They're not paying attention to issues. They're not paying attention to facts. They're not paying attention to the things that, that we've just been talking about. They only see this arrogant bully. And I call them loosely the suburban housewives. You know, Trump is everyone's vision of a bad first date. Uh, and how do we <laughs> How, what tolerance or how can they have the kind of tolerance they seem to have for uh, unrestrained violence, looting, thuggery, disregard of the law, everything else? I would think that at some point in time, there would be pushback. People would say, we, 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 we can't take this because the housewife's perspective is always her family and the safety of her home. And yet, how do we overcome the fact that Trump makes people feel unsafe? Yeah, so I mean, I think this goes back to some of the things I was trying to touch on at the very beginning. Um, I, I worry, and you just put your finger on a very important point that you know, if we have this kind of what I described as a, a very simplistic divide over this issue, um, and you make the argument that the country is racist, um, that's what Democrats are saying on one side, and on the other side, you're just saying law and order, law and order, that you're missing that group of people. You know, the, the problem is what the left is very effective at doing is making you feel that if you don't agree 100% with them, that somehow you are lacking or you are the problem. Um, and the opportunity, I think, for the president, if he were able to do it, or at least for the administration and his campaign more widely, needs to be to give people the confidence that you can both be in favor of law and order and believe in an agenda that deals with the problem that is out there. That's the only effective response to that simplistic view on the other side. Uh, can Trump do that? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, sometimes he seems to be able to kind of moderate that message um, and get that across. And then sometimes he just, uh, somebody didn't take away the phone. So, you know, I just, um, I wish I had a, a more effective answer. I can suggest what it is that I think the party and he needs to do, but actually uh, in any way, um, knowing if he is possible or capable of doing it, I'm just not sure. I think the only other thing that may play in at some point is that, you know, as these, these riots continue, people may lose more tolerance for them. Um, and as they begin to, again to see that contrast between you might Trump might not be perfect, but do you really want Joe Biden? Um, that may, may may play into their decisions too. Thanks for your question, Carl. We have a question from Parth Gupta. Parth, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, thank you. 
Uh, Ms. Strassel, I'd actually like to offer a definition of systemic racism and kind of get your comments on it. Um, this definition comes from NAACP President uh, Derek Johnson. It says, it's quote, the systems and structures uh, that have procedures or processes that disadvantages African Americans. Isn't that uh, synonymous with kind of what you've described, the inequalities of opportunity that disproportionately affect people of color? And if those are similar, um, is that enough to say that systemic racism exists? Thank you. Sure, I'm not sure. I mean, can you read that definition again? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so from Derek Johnson, uh, systems and structures that have procedures or processes that disadvantages African Americans. Well, I mean, look, systems and structures. Okay, notice that nowhere in there is laws or regulations or the Constitution or anything that actually do govern the way that systems operate. Um, systems and structures, look, I, I would argue that there are certainly inequalities of opportunities in certain systems that we have, for instance, right? I mean, let's, let's, let's look at this, all right? Why do we have failing schools in so many places? It's not because anyone's lacking money. Um, it's not because uh, in our school systems, we spend extraordinary amounts of money in a lot of these schools that are doing some of the worst jobs. Um, and it's not because there is anything on the books that says, uh, we need to teach, uh, we, we need uh, methods of instructions that fail minority students. There's nothing in the systems or structures. You do have a system, however, in which you've got um, teachers unions um, and where collective bargaining agreements make it almost impossible to fire poorly performing teachers. Um, you know, is that a racist system? I would not say so. Uh, but is it a, a failed system in which we are failing to give opportunity to all um, and failing certain classes of our citizenship? Yes, but I don't see anything in that definition that necessarily lends itself to the argument of systemic racism. Uh, thank you for your question, Parth. We have a question from Frank Conte. Frank, go ahead, please. Hi, hi, Kim. Um, long time reader, enjoy your material every Friday. I have a question, whether it's 2020 or 2024, what is the future of the GOP given the demographics of the nation? I think that conservatives and libertarians need to make, have an honest assessment that sometimes their ideas might not permeate as effectively as, as say that of Bernie Sanders, okay? And I think while Trump has adeptly stolen a couple of issues from the left over the last uh, couple of years, namely, criminal justice reform, trade with China, and, and a couple others, the, he's really transformed the, the Republican line of thinking on traditional issues. Where do we go from here if you're really a moderate free market type of person? Yeah, that is an excellent question. One thing, I mean, and I've thought about this a lot, is it is very difficult for me to see uh, the Republican Party anytime soon, post Donald Trump, uh, once again nominating uh, a Mitt Romney-like candidate to to lead the party and uh, to run as their nominee. You know, I I think that one of the results of Donald Trump is going to be a Republican Party that, as a whole, demands a much kind of, as it were, like sort of tougher leader. A little bit, you know. It just I, I find it. I think there might be a letdown for a lot of people if you return to kind of the the more bog standard Republican presidential candidate. Um, I totally agree with you that there needs to be a discussion about those demographics and a, a sort of urgency in finding issues that give the free market movement an inroad into different groups of Americans that traditionally have not listened to those arguments or rejected those arguments. And that's why I was talking about the opportunity agenda and the DeSantis story down in Florida. There are issues out there that resonate in these communities, but I think the Republican Party as a whole has failed to both embrace them and elevate them as top line agenda issues. Um, and, uh, you know, there is something too, there's a lot of people that there, there was, you know, people have talked about um, uh, reformicons, you know, so this group of folks that were advocating that we use 
instead of running on tax cuts, we run on sort of tax equality. I don't really necessarily agree with that, but their central argument that having a Republican party that runs every year on more tax cuts or, you know, it, those are vital aspects of what we do, but we have to have an agenda that is broader and that uh, gets us a hearing, as you said, with different communities of people, whether it be minor, like the Latino vote or the African American vote or the younger generation. Uh, because I, I agree, it's not necessarily sustainable, the set of issues that Trump has issued. Uh, and the and Americans, the, the group of Americans they most resonate with going forward, that's not a winning coalition. Kim, since you mentioned the tax cuts thing, I have to mention this has been a concern we have here at IPI, that, that conservatives have been so successful at cutting taxes over the past several decades that there's a, there's a diminishing return, right? I mean, you get to the point True. where you, you can't cut taxes anymore. There's nothing left to cut. And so we've got to have an economic agenda that is more than just tax cuts because it's sort of the curse of our own success. So the last totally question, agree. the last question is from Christine and it comes to us through the chat, but it's a great way actually to wrap things up. She quotes Victor Davis Hanson as saying that he views the 2020 election as an existential question on the fate of America. It reminds me a little bit about the argument in 2016 about the flight 93 election. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think for a lot of us, if anything, a lot of the uh, social unrest that we're seeing around us, you know, if anything, this seems like more of a Flight 93 election than 2016 did. So what are your thoughts on just how important this election is? Well, first of all, I love Victor Davis Hanson, and I would, I would never really want to disagree with anything that Victor says. However, <laughs> I am... Um, I, I have always been a little wary of, of suggesting that this or that election is the most consequential that we have ever seen. All elections matter. They all have consequences. And I, I try very hard to see all my books behind me to try to remember that um, we, all of us, humanity, always have a tendency to suggest that things have never been as bad as they are now. And uh, these are the most momentous times. We are living through some momentous times, but uh, things have been even rougher in the past in American history. You know, I take some happiness knowing that senators don't kill each other on the floor with, you know, uh, fire irons anymore, which has happened in the past. We've had some pretty raucous periods of time. Um, uh, we've had riots and unrest and, and great societal upheaval over the years. Um, hey, you know, since we're all talking about it, we don't live in a country anymore with slavery, thank God, okay, but we did for a very long time in our history. And so things have been worse before, and they may seem tough right now, and it could seem that this election could decide all, but I am, I, I have, I try to have a little bit more faith in our, our basic institutions and, and believe that we will we will endure uh, this election and the next and the one after that. Well, Kim, this has been really delightful. You have, if anything, you have just whetted our appetites to get you down here to Dallas in person uh, to where folks can meet you in person and, and hear from you at, at even greater length. I want to thank everybody who joined us today for being with us. I want to thank those of you who made donations on our website to help support our ability to do these kinds of events. We very much appreciate your support. And uh, with, with that, I'll wish everyone a good day. Kim, thank you very much again. We thoroughly enjoyed it. And I wish everyone me. else a, a good rest of their day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.